like to welcome everyone to our Monday morning training. And this one is certainly a topic that we've all been waiting for very um, eagerly at our reopening plan. And what I hope to do in the course of this conversation with you is answer many, many, many of your questions. However, there will certainly be more. And as Sandy said, uh, put them in the chat box. Wait till I go through most of the presentation because I think you'll find questions will be answered in, in subsequent slides. But uh, post your questions. Sandy will ask me as many as we can answer before 10 o'clock. And then after 10, if you have any additional questions, as Sandy said, you can send them to the email address. We'll remind you of it at the end of the presentation. Or you can talk about it in your department meetings because your department heads have been working hand in hand with me, as has Susan and her Welcome team. To Verizon Wireless. Your can now be somebody, somebody mute themselves. Um, to, to create this plan. So this, this plan has been created by a team of your colleagues. And let's get started. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Okay, somebody's got some audio on. So if they could mute it, that would be great. Okay, first of all, what I'd like to do is Enter a pre- your participant ID followed by pound. Otherwise, just press pound. You can you are in the meeting now. There are more than 140 participants. So Jamie, unfortunately, I'm going to hit mute everyone and then that's going to mute you. So you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, let's do that again. Yeah, I'm going to mute all. Okay, so go ahead and Jamie, go ahead and unmute yourself now. Oh. Yep, just Jamie, unmute yourself. Doesn't know how. Hold on. Hold on, Jamie. Let me come to you. Yep, go ahead. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? We sure can, thank you. Okay, here we go. I'm sorry, you know, one of the things that we're learning as we go is how to navigate all this technology. So uh, I've learned um, a lot myself this last couple of months. So I wanna start off by thanking each and every one of you for the patience, grace, and effort you've shown during this challenging time. Some of you have been working many more than 40 hours some of you have been working much less than 40 hours, but want to work more and want to help more. And we just appreciate all of you. We know that we started off in the midst of a very stressful time. This stressful time has continued and it's the backdrop of our lives. And it makes your commitment and your professionalism all the more dazzling in my eyes that you've been able to deliver these kinds of services and care about our kids in such a, a crazy world that we're all in. So thank you. And I just wanna say how proud I am to work with such a group of committed professionals. So how did we decide on a reopening plan? We had to wait for guidance from the Center for Disease Control, Department of Health, and last but not least, the uh, State Education Department. We've had to work with advocacy groups, one of which I run, I head, and attorneys to get clarification from the advocacy groups on the details that we needed to pay attention to. We created work groups, starting with a task force, and then five work groups to focus on particular aspects of reopening. These work groups, some of them haven't even met yet, um, but they will all meet in the next couple of weeks, and they're consisted of administrators, our staff, representatives, parents, board members, and community members. And we have had meetings, 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 and more meetings. 
this has been a real team effort and it's going to continue to be a real team effort. So um, we're forging ahead with, you know, marching together. So what was our timeline? We waited for the guidance from SED, which was delayed a couple of times, and we finally received it July 16th. That's less than two weeks ago. And then we had to submit the reopening plan to the Department of Health by Friday, July 31st. That gave us less than two weeks. And it was a very, very long application, a very confusing application, and it took a lot of work. And we've been working on it pretty much day and night from the time we read it to the time we posted it, which was just Friday. So Friday, actually Friday around four o'clock. So we're sharing it with you Monday at nine, which is not even one work day um, after we posted it. It will be sent to parents, counties, school districts on Tuesday, August 4th. And what will be sent to them is a summary of the plan. And that summary of the plan will be emailed to all of you today. The full plan is on our website and is 40 pages long about. So it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a reading um, journey which we welcome all of you to do. And uh, the link will be sent to parents and counties and school districts. However, we don't know if we're gonna open in the beginning of September until the governor lets us know. And he is uh, saying that he will let us know this week and uh, we are expecting it'll be closer to the end of the week. So if he follows the timetable that he set for himself, we should know if we're going to be starting the plan that I'm about to describe to you uh, on Friday, August 7th, we'll have that notification and we will of course share it with you. So we came up with some guiding principles for this journey that we've been on. And we wanna share them with you because they've guided everything we've done. The first is that the safety and well-being of our students and staff are our primary concern. And by well-being, I mean physical health and mental health. That is what we're gonna focus on every step of the way with your help. The second guiding principle is that we wanna offer high quality instruction to our students, regardless of the delivery model. And we may be going back to remote. I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, but however we're delivering the services, we want it to be the very best effort we can put forth. And our third guiding principle is that we're gonna be evaluating our policies on an ongoing basis. And this is one of the really good things about the plan guidelines. We have permission to keep changing them. We will be changing and revising them depending on what works and what doesn't work. And how are we gonna know what works and doesn't work? By, by living, <laughs> living the experience for one and hearing from you. So you have opportunity to give us feedback on the plan on an ongoing basis. And we're depending on you for that feedback because we're all in this together. So why are we opening at all? The reason we're opening is because the guidance was very clear. And it said that priority school opening must be given to programs that serve children with special needs and young children. So we got check marks in both those boxes. So the governor tried to open us this summer. He felt it was so important, but the message was very clear that we needed to open when schools open safely. Uh, so before the start of school, we are having ongoing communication with families and staff. One of our communication tools is today. Every Monday morning, we're sharing information 
Next Monday, Ellen will be sharing information on human resource information that you need to know tied to COVID. And we will be sharing information with families on an ongoing basis through letters, through our newsletter, through your Zoom sessions with them, through a school messenger. And school messenger will also be used as well as your email for sharing information with you. So remember to check your school email. Also happening before school starts, our families are given a form which they may use to request two additional months of remote instruction. Now we did a survey with all of our staff and all of our parents. And based on that survey, which was almost a month ago now, um, it was really interesting, the parallels. Almost all of our staff and almost all of our student, student families told us that with concerns and you know, some, uh, some anxiety, they would be uh, willing and interested in sending their child or coming into work with a hybrid program. So uh, that was very helpful. And those few families that are feeling like they still want to keep their children home can request an additional two months, but they can't change it midstream. So if they commit to two months, two months from the start date of the school year will be the time they can change it. Something else that's happening before school starts, and many of you are even in the classroom right now doing it, and that is reformatting our classroom spaces, our department spaces, um, our whole building, as a matter of fact, to create um, safe environment for students. We want student-specific materials. We need to get furniture out of the room so there's more room for physical distancing. We need to create signage that shows us where we walk. Uh, we are right now, and we need your help, setting up the building for the start of school. Well, one of the things that has happened during this crazy time in our life is we're being introduced to new vocabulary. I never was using the word Zoom in a sentence until a few months ago. And I don't think I ever used the word cohort in a sentence either. So cohort is being used a lot. We will be using it and it's important we all know what it means. It simply means a group of people banded together as a unit. And uh, it is impossible for the boundaries to be airtight. So there will be some mobility between the units, but we are trying to reduce the number of people working together as much as we can and as much as humanly possible, given the fact we have part-time staff, given the fact that kids have a lot of related services, uh, and, and there's you know, other complications too. But the, basically, each class will have an A and a B cohort, so two groups of students. Related services will be assigned to as few classes as we can, and we know that it's not gonna be a single class. So there'll be several classes that related services will be assigned to. Service delivery will occur in the classroom as much as possible. Uh, this is to keep the unit as self-contained as, as we can. And hallway traffic will be restricted, but you will see hallway traffic when you're going outside, which we hope to do a lot of. And uh, when either a student or a class is going outside, particularly, there won't be as much travel in between related services because related services will be occurring whenever possible in the classroom. Okay, here's the model. We're calling it a blended model. Some of the districts are calling it a hybrid. So you might hear that term. It's also what you could call our model. I like the word blended better because I think it's more descriptive and it seems a little friendlier. So students will be grouped in A or B cohorts or schedules based on the school district, transportation considerations, and student need. So uh, your class, your school coordinators, Phyllis with the help of Mary Alice and Sandy are trying to 
create groups that work with the transportation considerations and also with the difficulty of the student. Session A will attend on Mondays and Tuesdays. Session B will attend on Thursdays and Fridays. And when I say attend, I mean a full day of school, which uh, will be roughly 9 to 2.30. And I say roughly because of something we'll talk about in a minute. Wednesdays will be used for remote sessions. We'll be having to remote to all of the students in our school on Wednesdays. And we'll be talking more about that in a minute. It'll be used for team meetings, special cleaning, the deep cleaning that will happen between cohorts, staff training, and program evaluation. And when I say program evaluation, I mean what's working, what isn't working, and what do we have to change? And we'll be looking at that every single day. Also, classes and related services will have an A and a B cohort. And this is why when I say school day is from 9 to 2.30 for children, I say roughly because there will be staggered student admission. Uh, the, bus the bus situation is very complicated with buses having to also have physical distancing. So buses, school districts that used to send us one bus might need to send us two buses or the same bus and two shifts. And so we'll be receiving students during our blended model from 8.30 to 9.30 and we'll be putting students back on the bus between two and three. Now, I haven't mentioned hours for staff. Uh, they will generally be eight to three for our educational staff, but when we scratch our heads a little more about this model, we may decide that we wanna skew the hours for staff. This is not a decision we've made yet, so that some are coming in a little early leaving a little early, and some coming in a little later, leaving a little later. We haven't decided that yet, which is why I don't have a slide about it, but we will um, make that decision. How are we gonna stay safe? We're going to stay safe because staff will be wearing face masks and other protective equipment all day long. Now, will you get breaks to take off your mask? Absolutely. Will the breaks be structured during the workday? Well, if your classroom staff wants to structure them, you certainly can. The important thing is that when you leave the building to take your mask off, you do it at a time that it's safe for you to leave the building. But we do not expect people to endure mask wearing all day if they can't do it. Um, and you'll be wearing other personal protective equipment if your job is requiring you to have um, under six feet of physical distance from a student. Uh, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing throughout the school day and after school, uh, much more than we've ever done before. We have an excellent new cleaning system that's non-toxic and gets rid of the virus. Uh, and we are hiring additional custodial help that'll be around all day during the school day, uh, but it will also be all hands on deck for helping with some of the more minor cleaning and sanitizing. There'll be signage to indicate the flow of staff and physical distancing guidelines. There'll be places to stand while you wait your turn to come into the building. Uh, and as Dan mentioned to you in an earlier workshop, uh, there'll be temperature taking and forms to complete uh, before you can enter the building. The furniture will be adjusted to allow for safe space requirements. And of course, the materials will be organized so that there's no cross-contamination between students' use of them. Staff and students who are ill will be separated and sent home. Students will have their temperature taken when they get off the bus. If they have a temperature, they will immediately be put in outside tented areas and their parents will be called or emergency contact for pickup. There'll be outhouses out there to wash hands and, um, and use if a student is being um, 
quarantined outside. Staff will take their temperatures when they come in. If they have a temperature, they're going home. Uh, and we'll be talking much more about that when Ellen makes her presentation next week. So some of this information we'll be digging deeper about when we have our subsequent Monday morning presentations. I'm excited about the first week of school because I think we've been very thoughtful about it, although it does come with its challenges. If the governor says we can begin by our calendar date, Tuesday, September 8th, which is the day after Labor Day, we will be all hands, uh, all staff in the building, but we will not have students in the building the first week of school. So we'll be running Tuesday the 8th through Friday the 11th, pending the governor's approval. And the staff will work full time at school, completing classroom setup, attending team meetings, having remote team meetings, remote staff meetings, um, bus schedule orientation, uh, delineate job descriptions. Job descriptions will be tweaked a little uh, due to COVID jobs and in-service training. I think uh, uh, four days of being in the building without students will better prepare us to receive them safely. But to do that, we have to commit, according to the regulations, now this is the regulations now, it's not my decision or anyone else's decision at the school, have remote at least half hour instruction for all students Wednesday through Friday. Now we're waiting for further guidance about the attendance. The attendance that I'll talk about again a little more in another slide um, is a little tricky uh, because the first week of school, the students have to be in attendance three days to, for us to be paid, which means we have to have, or have to try our hardest to have three days of remote contact with each student's family. Uh, and more about that, not today, but when I get more guidance from the state, because we have a lot of questions and concerns about that, as I'm sure you do. How the heck are we going to do it when parents don't remote with us, for instance, a big question. Uh, so I, I can't answer those questions yet, but I'm, I'm hoping we'll have more answers as we go. Monday, September 14th continuing based on low COVID-19 incidents, we will start our blended learning model. The Monday, Tuesday students will come on Monday and Tuesday. Um, on Wednesday, we will have uh, remote instruction for students and staff in the building. And on Thursday and Friday, we will have remote, uh, we will have uh, the B comp, cohort coming, and when we have the A cohort, we'll be doing remote instruction for the B cohort, and when we do the B cohort, we'll be doing remote instruction for the A cohort, and I'll be telling you more about that and how we think we can manage that in a minute. Each class will have no more than six students, and if we have all of our staffing, we will have one-to-one -one staffing for all of our students. And we feel that that is essential because many of our staff, as you well know, will not social distance or rather physical distance, and they will not necessarily wear protective gear. So we do feel that the staffing um, is essential for safety, and we're glad that we can provide one-to-one -one staffing. Class occupancy will be limited to allow for the recommended physical distancing space. So we've done the math and we have uh, the ability to put at least 13 uh, bodies in every classroom. And some classes are a little bigger and they can go up to 15. And of course the other buildings, the other rooms in the school have different occupancy. So we will be posting the occupancy that each class can have uh, outside the door. So we're all clear exactly how much physical distancing we'll have room for in each class. What will a school day look like? 
So while the students are in the building, this is what it's going to look like as far as we can tell so far. Safety precautions will be followed by all staff all the time. Your minute you enter the building, all safety precautions need to be followed till the minute you leave the building. Uh, and also the buses. So this is going to be new. Buses will have physical distancing. Uh, bus drivers and aides will have to wear masks and they'll have to clean the buses following the, um, the guidelines the state has given us. We'll have more, here's a gift that comes with this model. We'll have more opportunities than ever for one-to-one -one instruction. And we think that our students will be coming back to us with greater need for one-to-one -one instruction. So uh, it's great that we'll be able to offer that. We will be using outdoor instructional opportunities whenever the safety and the weather permit. We will be um, supplying the schools, both schools, Kingston and Ellenville, with more outdoor seated spaces for staff and students. And we can use the spray park space for uh, quiet um, outdoor activities uh, that won't distract students by seeing the playground equipment. Also, we can take walks with students. Related services will be in the classroom whenever possible, as I've mentioned, but they could also be outdoors. Students will be physically distanced throughout the day, during lunch, and all other activities. We will not have any assemblies, there will be no field trips, and we will have very few school visitors unless it's an essential um, situation. So it's going to look quite a bit different what will a day at home look like? Remember that every student that is coming to school will also have three days at home, the days their cohort doesn't meet, and Wednesday. And now I'm going to be sharing what it's gonna look like based on the current information we have from State Ed. This is what we need guidance on, and I, I am hoping um, that we'll have some tweaking to this. But right now, this is what we know. All students, and this is right from the regs, this is their language, will be offered a meaningful instructional opportunities every day remotely. This could be remoting into the classroom for instruction with classroom staff, and this includes our assistant teachers and aides, as long as the special educator is supervising. It could be one-to-one, -one uh, instruction in the classroom in a corner with one of the with classroom staff or with their therapist or it could be group sessions with kids that are here at school and kids that are remote combined or just kids that are remote combined uh, related services uh, or in the classroom and we are in the classroom going to use the whiteboards the smart boards and it works uh, very nicely to have a big screen that students at home can see and, and children in the classroom can see at the same time. So uh, we, we're pretty excited about uh, the option that the smart boards are giving us in Kingston. Here is the part of the regulations we are hoping to learn more about. Attendance must be taken. So we are mandated to try to have remote contact with all students not in school every single day that they are there. And if they're not in attendance, they'll be marked absent. And if they have chronic absenteeism, and I know many of our families are not electing Zoom sessions now, so if we were at marking them absent, it would be a lot of absences. We haven't been doing that because we weren't mandated to before, but we are now. So that's going to be a big difference. And we have to make the very best possible effort to meet the IEP. Will we be able to meet the IEP for all of our students all the time? I would say probably not, but we can get much closer to it now that the students are coming into school. And if we can't offer individual sessions, offering a group session in its place 
is better than no session at all. So as close as we can get to each student's IEP will be our goal if we can. And if we can is a big part of that sentence. How and when will this blended model of instruction change? The very best part of the guidelines were that we can continue to make ongoing modifications in our procedures and in our plans that are posted on our website when we see what is working best. Uh, and I'm already gonna be making some changes today because uh, Dr. Meyer, bless her heart, read the entire 40 plus page plan and gave us some great guidelines and we're going to incorporate many of them. So the, the plan, the written plan, and the, the plan that we act on is a flexible living document. And that's very reassuring. Decisions to return to remote instruction will be based on COVID-19 reoccurrence frequency. It will not be our decision that we just wanna change it because we think it's time. It'll be based on whether we specifically as a school have an outbreak of COVID and we need to close and there are guidelines for that uh, that are in our plan, or it will be based on whether our region has uh, a new uh, burst of COVID episodes and the whole region needs to close. So our governor, our local health department, our medical staff, Dan, Dr. Meyer, our Ellenville medical staff, will be helping to make these decisions. When will we return to business as usual, the old business as usual from before the 16th of March? My guess is it won't happen until we have a vaccine, but the way we're stating it is we will return to full week in-person instruction when we no longer need to wear protective gear or have protective guidelines for our health and safety. And again, that will most likely be when we have a vaccine. Okay, so some of you have been working all the time, some of you haven't. And we've been very, very happy to be able to pay everybody because we know it's not your choice if we didn't give you a full-time job. You were there available and because of the idiosyncrasies of the regulations, which said instruction needs to be offered by credentialed professionals, and because of um, the craziness of the world, we haven't been able to, to, to employ all of you fully. That is about to change. We need each and every one of you to help us open school safely. And most of you we need in the building as many staff as possible in the building to keep us all safe. We need you more than ever. And something that Ellen will be talking about when she presents next week, I want to alert you to because I don't want anyone to be surprised. If you have made vacation plans for the, during the three week period when school is not in session that take you to one of the 30 states that New York State has quarantined, when you come back, you will have to have a two week quarantine at home and it will be a quarantine without pay. So we don't want anyone to be stuck, not getting paid and having to stay home because they went and visited Texas, for instance, during our, our three week period. So please be mindful of your vacation plans and stay in the States that um, the governor has felt are safe and information about those states can be um, easily found online and will be shared by Ellen when we meet next Monday. Okay, so many of you have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts at home. Some of you have Eagle Scouts that have made uh, their Eagle Scout um, project at the school. Some of you were Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, there were brownies when you were, or Cub Scouts, do they still have those? Uh, when you were young. Uh, and you know that there was a, a creed. Well, we feel that this is the time 
for all of us to also have a creed. And here's what I'd like it to be. First of all, it's very important that we're patient. We are traveling completely uncharted waters and we, there's no way to be wise about the journey until we travel it. So we will be learning as we go. This is not the way we usually operate. Usually we have most of our answers to what we need to do ahead of time. This time we're going to be creating the best policies and procedures as we see what works and what doesn't work. We're starting with our reopening plan document, but we're going to be changing it as we go. It's extremely important that we're flexible with this because there's no way to have it all fixed ahead of time. So again, flexibility um, is not something we've asked uh, from you as much as we'll be asking from you this time. It's extremely important that we be safe. We must rely on each other to help stop the spread of COVID-19 in our school building. And that means not only following our safety precautions in the building, but also following them with your family and your extended network outside the building 24 seven. Because if you go to a bar, uh, that people are not wearing masks or have a family gathering that is not physically distanced, you could get the virus and you could come to work and give it to the rest of us. So we are all in the same situation. Our parents, we're gonna be saying this very strongly to them, the same as we're saying to you, that the most respectful, safe thing we can do is follow safety precautions 24-7. It's also important that we're compassionate. This is a scary time. We are full of anxiety. I'm a little anxious about starting. I'm sure you are. We're full of anxiety for the health and safety of our family and friends. Some of you have lost family members. I lost my aunt who was in a nursing home and she died of the virus several months ago. So some of us are experiencing loss. This goes for our families too. Some of us have lost our jobs. Uh, none of you have fortunately, but some of your family members may have. Um, we're all dealing with a lot of stuff, probably more stuff in our lives than we currently had, than we formerly had rather. And so empathy for each other and ourselves has never, never been more important. And finally, the final part of our oath of office, so to speak, and I'm asking each and every one of you to do this, and that is to stay positive. Every situation in our life, we can choose to walk on the sunny side or walk on the shady side. You know, it's always our choice and negativity is contagious. So given the fact that we are the best group of professionals in any school in New York State and that we are going to be as thoughtful as possible about everything we do, I think we have every reason to be very, very positive that we're going to make this work. And so you know, I want to thank you all in advance for being part of the team that makes that happen. And that does, I believe, let me check. Oh no, I have one more slide and here it is. Your thoughts, your suggestions, your comments are very welcome. The fact that we posted the plan before you were able to give them to us is not because we didn't care about them. It's because we had no time no time to write the plan and collect information in a concerted way ahead of time. But we do have time now to be thoughtful. And particularly, we have time to be thoughtful once we start. So to coin the oft used um, adage, it does take a village. 
And I, I sort of like this village picture because all the villagers are socially or rather physically distanced from each other. So that was sort of nice to see. So in our physically distanced village, um, we need all of you. So read the plan. The plan is at our website, which is easy to find, www.centerforspectrumservices.com. You'll see the summary of the plan, which is basically the information I've shared with you today. That summary will be sent to you by email later on this afternoon. And you can ask your questions and comments today on the chat. Uh, as long as we have, let's see what time it is. We have 15 minutes for questions. Or you can send them to reopening at centerforservices.org. And we will try to get back to you in a timely way. So now um, I'd like to hear from you. And Sandy will be looking at the chats and asking me some of the questions, especially ones that um, are repeatedly asked. Right. So okay. thank you. So, um, so Jamie, as I look through the questions, I mean, everyone has great questions, very thoughtful questions. People are thinking about the realities of getting back to school. I, a lot of the questions I think will be answered. Um, there, um, uh, let's see. So, so some people are talking about, um, you know, when you reference the Wednesday, right? So you said on Wednesdays, we are going to be having meetings. So someone asks, um, someone commented, it seems like we're putting a lot on into Wednesdays. If I have a 16 person caseload, um, how can I see all those kids in one day and do team meetings? I realize that's a logistical kind of thing. There's not really an answer for that now, but you know, people are thinking about the 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 the, 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 the you know the responsibilities on Wednesdays. Right. Well, first of all, it, let's take a speech uh, pathologist who might be the one that asked the question because she yes. or an OT who asked the question because of the caseload. You will be seeing a lot of those kids during um, the the time that they're in session. So you won't have to deliver all of the other remote sessions to them on Wednesday. Uh, number two, we're not saying that on Wednesday, every related services and every class will deliver a session. We're saying there'll be one contact at minimum with one of those groups of people with each child. And some of those contacts can be, if we can schedule it with parents, in a group format. So I know we have some kids that aren't groupable, we have many kids that aren't groupable, but when we can, we should. And that can be in the classroom, one half hour on a Wednesday, or it can be a related service person. And the challenge is gonna be coming up with these schedules coming up with these schedules with parents that can um, commit to being present so their child can access us. Now, the guidance that I'm hoping that we'll receive and we don't have yet, um, may allow us to do learning plans in place of remote contact. And if they do, um, we won't have to have daily remote contact. But right now, because the guidelines are tying it to attendance, it, 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 it is read as though we have to have some kind of contact with every student daily. Again, this is the part of the plan that we're asking for some consideration with. And we've asked two attorneys, and these two attorneys have direct contact with the state ed policymakers. So fingers crossed that we get more guidance on this one. I think that's the best I can do with that one, with that question, Sandy. Okay, here's one. Um, this is about logistics in Kingston. Somebody asks, well, this is probably for Ellen though, will we be able to continue to clock in and out with ADP using the app on our phone so there isn't the big long line when we go to clock in? Yes, and Ellen, maybe that's something she could talk about a little bit more on Monday, which is how to clock in and how to clock out. But um, as, as Susan and I discussed it earlier, the answer now is yes. You can clock in on your ADP instead of scanning in. 
Somebody else asks, um, where will mask breaks take place, both for staff and students? Outside or in your car. Okay. Um, somebody also commented, this is great because this is true. We've talked about this. Making sure, somebody says, um, we really need to make sure that emergency contact numbers are up to date so we can reach someone when a child is sick. Absolutely. We have a lot of communication to do with our families and we have to get them to commit to being safe 24 seven, like we're asking you to commit. We have to get them to commit to, even if they haven't in the past, having sessions with us, if the attendance um, regulations remain the same on a daily basis. And we have to get them to commit to uh, giving us emergency numbers that work because their child's not coming in the building if they have symptoms that are not understandable by a doctor's note. Now we do have some students who have chronic loose bowels. That's just the way they roll, literally and figuratively. Um, and loose bowels could be a sign of childhood uh, COVID. So for families that have children that have similar symptoms to COVID, we will need doctor's notes so that we can be more discriminating. But mostly a child shows a symptom, they're not coming into the building, they show a symptom during the school day, they're going to one of the exclusionary rooms we're creating. We're using the entire one-to-one -one suite as um, student exclusion rooms inside the building if the student gets sick during the day. And the little room off Dan's office will be the doctor or the nurse's room to look at children with suspected COVID symptoms. So we have a well child um, nurse room and a, a potentially COVID infected child nurse room. Somebody else asked, what happens if there's a corona case in the school? If a student or staff member has COVID, what would be the policy for that that would look like? We have all the exclusion uh, guidelines in the plan. They're, they're in the big plan because uh, they're a little complicated. I think Dan did share some of it when he spoke on Monday a couple weeks ago. And uh, I, I refer you to the, um, the COVID portion of our reopening plan for all the detailed information on how long people need to stay home and what happens if um, a, a staff or a student become um, ill with COVID and how we notify people. That's all written up in our plan. And perhaps maybe we should do a, another a presentation on that. And, and we probably will do that, but I'm, I'm not prepared to go over that kind of detail with you now, but you can find it in the plan. Okay. Um, somebody brings up a point about block programs. So they say, um, will services be blocked within a classroom to limit the back and forth between rooms throughout the day? Like a speech therapist or an OT coming in and seeing student, student, student yes. in one room, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's gonna be the strategy. Nothing is carved in stone, nothing can be perfect. We have to all be flexible, like our new creed says. But yes, whenever possible, service delivery should be in blocks, when possible. We should okay. sure try it. Um, somebody asked, some, uh, let's see. Um, it seems like this, this was probably more of a medical question. It says cloth and paper face coverings are not PPE. Uh, they're recommended to protect people when everyone else is wearing them and cannot socially distance. Our plan is stating we are only going to try to be one-to-one -one and will not be socially distanced from students who will not be wearing any face coverings. The CDC seemed pretty clear in either distance or face coverings. Mm -hmm. So is okay. our plan enough? Does that meet the CDC guidelines for schools? Our plan does meet the CDC guidelines. I refer you to the plan. It's 40 pages long, but they're very clear chapters. So you don't have to read the whole thing if you don't want to. You can pick and choose the parts. But let me just talk about physical distance and one-to-one -one with students. We all know that all of our students will not wear masks. 
And we don't want it to become a behavior problem where we're forcing masks on students. In fact, safety care even says that when a child needs full physical restraint, you should be sure that the mask is off. So uh, we understand that uh, all of our students will not be wearing masks. Uh, we do also have, thanks to Susan's uh, brother, um, face shields for students and staff. And for those students who are too sensitive around the oral area for contact, like a mask provides, they may be willing to wear shields, which does not touch their face except the elastic that goes around their head. Um, it's not as safe as masks, according to the CDC, but it is safer. So we will try masks. We're letting students bring their masks from home that they're comfortable with. We're doing training. Uh, you, many of you are doing training right now with your students with social stories and other trainings to help them learn to wear masks. Many of the children have been wearing masks you know, in their communities with their families, but some will not tolerate it or they will not tolerate it all day long. And we have very clear guidance that this should not be an issue of whether a child can come to school. The bus companies have the same strict guidance that they can't deny a student transportation if the student is unable to wear a mask because of their disability. So staff who are going to be in physical proximity with students, and we do recognize that that will have to happen quite a bit, will be wearing PPEs. You can wear a mask, uh, which protects others, we understand. You can wear a face shield. We have um, also garments, um, and you can wear gloves. Uh, so that we, and we're providing everything. You know, it's, this is a, an unfunded mandate that we're also um, striving to figure out, uh, but we provide the PPEs for you. So that is the way that we're gonna go with this. Staff that are going to be under six feet apart from students will need to wear the protective gear necessary. Okay, somebody asked about the air circulation, um, air circulation and filtration in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, wondering if it's gonna be any different, are there any changes? Is it gonna be anything different in filtration systems? Okay, so um, I'm gonna answer a little bit and then I don't know if Susan um, can, can also answer. Can you identify Susan and unmute her? Sure. Is that well, let, me, let me start by saying we have new air conditioning so uh, we have a much more even um, air conditioning system than we used to. We also are gonna have a new bathroom in the preschool wing. That's not air circulation, but just thought I'd mention that. Uh, and uh, Susan is actively scratching her head about what else we need to do, consulting with professionals. Uh, this is very much in our, in our sites. Uh, our air circulation system is better than many, many, many schools. Uh, and we're going to be scratching our heads for ways to make it better that we can afford. So I don't know, Susan, if you want to add. Yeah, anything. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so again, I direct you, as Jamie did to the plan, we have, Brian and I have been meeting with HVAC contacts on a regular basis looking at what we can do to enhance the air circulation in both Kingston and Allenville. At this point, we have not made any changes. We're waiting for a report from our HVAC company, Lau, which we should have this week. Okay. Window, the, the state guidelines encourage windows to be open. If you're in a classroom and you don't have issues with windows being open, such as children or staff with asthma or allergies to outside sources, then you're welcome to open the windows, even with the air conditioning on. Okay. Um, someone has asked about the, the email and when, when will they expect responses from the questions that they asked and sent to the reopening at Center for Spectrum Services email? Well, you know, I, don't, I, I can speak for myself and Susan and the department heads who I see quite a lot of, 
And I can say that we're working very long hours into the night, weekends, um, and we're trying to get as much done as possible. So if we are bombarded with questions, it will be a little bit more time till you get the answers. If they come in on a you know, regular basis, but not on an overwhelming number, we, we can get to them within a day or two, I'm sure. Uh, I'm, uh, we are also preparing Q and A's uh, that we're going to post on the website. Uh, they, we were particularly thinking of them for, for parents, but we can add your questions too, uh, to them with the answers uh, as, as we learn about them. So uh, that is not up yet because we're not quite sure what questions people are gonna be asking because we've got a pretty long, pretty detailed 40 plus page reopening plan that has a lot of information in it. So uh, look at it and look at the table of contents and, and see if your question is answered there. Uh, if it isn't, please ask it. Or if you don't understand the answer, please ask it and we will answer it as soon as we can. And sometimes we don't know the answer. In fact, uh, Maureen sent a, a, a very um, lovely uh, series of questions and uh, some of them we didn't know the answer to. We just haven't gotten to the point of those policies yet. And, uh, and one of the things I've been saying to the people that I've been working with is knowing the questions is the beginning of wisdom. So if you ask a question that is something we haven't thought of yet, we might not have the answer right away, but knowing the question is something that will allow us to think about an answer. So uh, we consider, we welcome questions and we consider that part of collecting wisdom. Okay. Yeah, there's questions, a lot of questions about um, closing school when people are exposed, right? So up until now, we've talked about what happens if a, school, if a child gets sick at school. There's questions about closing school. What happens when a member in the student's family has been exposed and then they come to school and expose, ah. do we close? Like those kinds of things. Yeah, those are all good questions. Um, I, I'm going to uh, defer to Susan to respond to that one because she wrote that part of the closing okay. plan and, and I mean reopening plan and knows maybe a little deeper than I how to answer those particular questions. Susan, can you can you answer or do you? No, I have to go. I have an audit meeting now. Okay. Okay. Now, so if someone puts the information in chat. I will get back to you. Okay. 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 As a Thanks, everybody. Great to right. see you. Bye. Thanks again, for, as Jamie said, for everybody working so diligently to get us back up and running. Somebody asked Jamie, who will be staying with the students that are sick outside? Classroom staff, um, where, or uh, we will be hiring uh, a uh, COVID assistant to assist Dan in Kingston. So it could be the COVID assistant, depending on where we are with um, students boarding, the, uh, coming off the bus. Um, but there may be classroom staff, yeah. Okay. Again, fully suited. Okay. Our, the question is, are we requiring staff to be tested before coming back to school? That's a really good question. Um, and it was suggested at our main task force meeting. And we are still scratching our heads about whether we can do that or not, or whether we should and whether we can do that. I don't have an answer to that. It's a great idea. I would certainly love to, to ask it, but uh, we haven't finished digesting that, that, that piece of information yet. That's a great example of a question that hadn't occurred to us that was asked that now opens up a pathway to figure out an answer. Uh, so more about that will be coming if we're making that request. Okay, and there are a few more questions. Some of them are sort of um, specific to how things are gonna roll out in classrooms. So maybe people would be sending those to reopening at Center for Spectrum Services since it is 10 o'clock, or they would have these conversations with their classroom coordinators. Or uh, their team meetings, 
Yeah. Or with their special educator. Yeah, a lot of these questions, if they're class specific, are probably better asked with uh, to uh, your classroom coordinators or your special educators than, than to the general mailbox. Right. Uh, because then you can brainstorm together because again, you may be asking questions we haven't thought of and brainstorming with the people that are in charge of your classroom is the way to go. So I guess we've now gotten to a little bit after 10. I know some of you have to start related services. And I just want to thank you for the bottom of my heart. I know that this is not an easy uh, reopening. It's complicated. If you've read the other school district plans, you'll see it's no more complicated and crazy than any of the other plans around the, um, the United States and in our state and in our region and in our county. But it doesn't make it any less stressful. So. You know, the best way to move forward is by cooperating with each other, collaborating with each other, brainstorming with each other. And I know we've got the right stuff in our faculty to open safely for students. So I just want to thank you in advance for the courage and the professionalism and the dedication that you have been showing and that you will be continuing to show. And I guess with that, um, I want to thank you for coming this morning. Remind you that next week it'll be Ellen and she'll be also sharing some important information that you might not know. Remember not.